Um, so welcome to Open Democracy's weekly live discussion. My name is Vishali Bardwaj. I'm a sports broadcaster for the Premier League Prime Video Sport, BBC Five Live, and I also write for The Guardian as well. Now, we want this conversation to involve you, the viewers, as much as possible. So thank you to everyone who has submitted their questions and comments ahead of time. We're going to try and get to as many of them as possible during this hour-long chat. Now, if you're joining us on Zoom and you have a question or comment for us, just click on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen and uh, type into the chat window but if you're joining us on Facebook put your questions in the comments section so what are we going to be talking about today well we're talking about football fans versus billionaires who owns the beautiful game a very topical issue I have to say considering what's happened in the world of football in the last month or so and I am joined by a stellar panel so let me introduce them all to you so we have Nick Harris who is an investigative journalist uh, specializing in the business and finance of sport especially football he's the owner and editor of sportingintelligence.com and the chief sports news correspondent at the mail on Sunday. We also have Nancy Gillen, who is a content coordinator of Give Me Sport Women, and she also spent two years reporting on sports politics at insidethegames.biz. James Montague also joins us today. He's an award-winning writer and author of The Billionaires Club, The Unstoppable Rise of Football Super Rich Owners. Definitely gonna be uh, picking his brains about that book. And we also, last but not least, have Nick McGeehan, who is a founding director of Fair Square, which is campaign on issues from Saudi Arabia's proposed takeover of Newcastle to the issue of migrant worker deaths in Qatar. So let's kick things off. James, I have to go to you first because you have written a very topical book, uh, which fits in nicely with what we're talking about today. Who owns a beautiful game? Is it the game of billionaires or is it the game for football fans? I mean, technically the fans own the game, right? Because it's our money, whether it comes through the turnstiles or whether it comes through subscriptions that fuel these massive TV deals that have kind of taken football into the 21st century into a new stratosphere. So technically it should be us, it should be the fans. And if you go to somewhere like Germany, it most often is the fans because they've got this system 50 plus one where, you know, membership organisations own the majority of, of football clubs. But in reality, it's not. And it's certainly not in the Premier League and, and it's increasingly changing in the rest of European football as well. That around the birth of the English Premier League, the type of owner changed. It, before, it used to be millionaires, local businessmen, uh, sometimes people who wanted to kind of burnish their reputation, a little bit advertising for their company. Um, but that changes really with the... I mean, there's, there's a few characters that you can look at that where, you know, Jack Walker at Blackburn, for instance. But it's really 2003 and the, uh, the purchase of of Chelsea by Roman Abramovich means that everybody's scrambling to find their own billionaire and it becomes kind of arms race where clubs are willing to hand over the keys to their clubs because we have such lax rules around who can own the club. I mean, the fabled owners and directors test, um, a fit and proper owners, it's very easy to buy a football club. So we've had a, a slew of extremely um, dodgy people own clubs and to join that club effectively now you have to be a billionaire so it, it, it is the billionaire class that have made football their game hmm. and Nancy what do you think about that yeah I agree and I think it's kind of now got to a point where it's very hard to to go back from that and I think what's happened really interesting after the Super League is obviously you've seen um, you know the protests and and you've seen um, supporters of certain clubs kind of campaigning for a change of, of ownership. Um, being an Arsenal fan, it's been really interesting to see Daniel Ek, the um, CEO and, and co-founder of Spotify, um, launch a bid to take over the club. But then you've got to a point where it's essentially kind of, okay, so you're just looking at kind of which billionaire is, is more palatable, essentially. Um, you're still kind of in the same situation uh, where you've still got billionaires own, you know, running, running the show. And is it, you know, are we too far gone to the point where you can't now reverse it, where you can't have a system like you do in Germany with 50 plus one, you can't kind of have a majority of fan ownership. So it's, it's been really interesting to kind of see a lot of the discussion around, like from the Super League and then what we want from it and, and whether, you know, is it just a situation now where we, you know, we get a billionaire owner that maybe is a bit nicer or might support the club that we support and does that make it any better? Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned the European Super League. We will talk about that 
uh, shortly. Uh, Nick McGeehan, um, because we've got two Nicks on, on the panel. Um, what did you make of the whole European Super League saga? Um, well, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm slightly the odd one out in this panel and I'm, I'm the person who, who's not a football person. I'm, I'm a sort of human rights person and, and worked in the Gulf for, for a long time and saw how they, um, you know, how they came to, to put loads of money into, into European football. I think it was very interesting for me how, who, who went for it and who, who didn't go for it. You know, the fact that, that Manchester City, for example, um, who have no need to, um, to make money from the game, who are not in any financial distress because they're run by, by the government of Abu Dhabi, um, were one of the first ones to pull out. You know, ditto Chelsea. You know, Abramovich is not in it to, to turn a profit. And it was the, the old money um, that, that, that was looking to get into a Super League to, you know, to resolve their financial difficulties. So I guess it, it demonstrated the manner in which um, outside money, new money, a lot of it coming from the Gulf, has, has overturned the natural order, um, or certainly the old order. Um, so for me, that was uh, coming from the perspective that I do, that, that's what I found um, particularly interesting about the, the Super League in, uh, incident. And Nick Harris, remember that day when, when Chelsea were in action, I think it was at home to Brighton. And of course, we were getting all the word that Manchester City were pulling out, but then Chelsea followed suit. And we saw the scenes where all those Chelsea fans were outside Sanford Bridge. Some of them were sitting down, very powerful scenes. Um, how powerful were those scenes to, do you think, the, the owners of some of these football clubs? Uh, hugely powerful. And I think um, if there's anything that we get out of the Super League, th this, this might ultimately turn to be turn out to be a positive thing, a turning point because of the strength of feeling, the unanimity of feeling. I know there was some politicking going on, particularly with the British government, but in terms of the groundswell opinion from football fans around, certainly around Europe and around the world, the, the, the total unanimity of opposition to this grasping plan to, to, to steal football, to end it as, as a competitive spectacle. Um, the backlash, um, uh, from that might end up being something positive. On that day itself, I know there were officials at Chelsea who were horrified to see the Chelsea fans, of all people, in the streets, just, you know, not violently, but, but very vocally opposing this takeover. We saw them at Arsenal, we saw them, um, um, we saw them outside other clubs, Liverpool fans, Manchester United. These fans are really opposed to it, the fans of the clubs themselves, and that in, certainly, in Chelsea's case, made the owners change their mind. Um, in Manchester City's case, they obviously, you know, they, they claimed a brief that they were wavering to start with, in which case, why sign a legally binding document to help steal football? I mean, um, so I, I still think that with the, the government review in, in the UK, the, the supposedly fan-led review, the fact that FIFA yesterday announced um, a sort of... Uh, um, a project where they're going to ha have an overview of what should happen to the future of football. There's obviously a power struggle going on here between FIFA and UEFA, but maybe what happened with the ESL, although it was driven by this group of different billionaires, both plutocratic sort of, you know, um, um, nation state owners and the, and the, and the primarily, um, um, you know, capitalist American owners like the Glazers and Cronkey and, and John Henry, but all billionaires, all basically seeking either wealth, more share of the wealth, or power, or both, I think they may have shot themselves in the foot if ultimately um, we lead to a proper serious wide-ranging debate about who should own football. Um, I try to be an optimist and I hope that maybe we come out of this with a football that is in some ways saved or, or made better rather than, you know, the end of football as we know it had this Super League gone ahead. And, and James, we, we saw the scenes obviously in the streets on that day. We've seen various different protests obviously since then as well. But of course, there seemed to be a, a consensus on social media itself from everyone really in the world of football against the European Super League. Um, do you think that had an impact perhaps on the eventual unravelling of that league? I think it did. I mean, I, I, mean I, I watched it in real time when I think it was Martin Zieger at the Times that broke the story and... You know, I think within a couple of hours, it felt like there's no way that this can go ahead. There's no way they're going to get this. Is this the, the, the weight of feeling um, on social media? And I know that social media isn't real life, but even that was just it was such a furious response that I thought, I think they're expecting it to go differently. And I think they expected 
to get away with it, Scooby Doo style, if it wasn't for you crazy kids would have got away with it, um, because of COVID, because the fans wouldn't have been there. And look, I, I but the book I wrote after the Billionaires Club is called One Three One Two, and it's about the story of of the ultra movement around the world. We don't really have ultras as as fan group; they're quite a maligned group. But as a, as an entity, they can be very uh, very good at campaigning. They're one of the reasons why in German football fans are very good at putting pressure on uh, people in power. Um, sometimes it can spill over into very dark areas as well. But most of that kind of fan culture has kind of disappeared from English and British football. And I didn't even write a chapter about, about England, although English kind of influence is, all, is there kind of all the way through in other countries. And so, yeah, I mean, for me, it was a shock to see the, the, it, that pe people were so angry that they were still able to get out on the streets and organise. And that pressure and those scenes, and it was, and I honestly think if they'd, if they'd done this a month, if those owners had done this a month earlier, when there were more restrictions because of COVID, because we were just coming out of it, vaccinations were being ramped up. Uh, they just got it. They just got their timing wrong by a couple of weeks because I don't think we would have seen those scenes outside, outside of Arsenal and outside of Chelsea in particular, and especially outside of Manchester United. And you know, a lot of people would say if you looked at Manchester United, they got a game called off against Liverpool, the big, probably one of the biggest games worldwide the Premier League could could show. And people were like, "Oh, this isn't the way to do it." I was absolutely, I was very happy to see that game get called off because that's exactly the kind of direct action that actually focuses people's attention, and actually changes uh, the direction of travel. And, you know, you don't condone violence, but, you know, sometimes you have to protest in that way to make things happen. So for me, the biggest surprise was that something that I thought was long gone that had been legislated out of existence, policed out of existence. I mean, English football fans are policed in, in, an, in a horrific way. And they managed to organize from, from almost zero to get to make worldwide headlines and help to put the, the brakes on this, this movement. And, you know, I was, a, there was, a, I, was, I was quite proud to see that happen. And Nancy, James has just mentioned it there, the timing of that European Super League announcement. I think it was a Sunday night, wasn't it? Or Sunday afternoon. Were you surprised that it came just before the season ended? Yeah, I think it, it kind of seemed a bit, um, I think because of the matches that were then taking place essentially took on no meaning. So, you know, this season has been a bit of a strange one, but it's been relatively entertaining because you've had um, that battle for Champions League, for Europa League and now for the Conference League as well. Um, whether that be any good or not, I don't know. But, um, it, you know, it kind of had that element of people fighting it out for those places and then them announcing it kind of a couple of days before the season then made those matches meaningless and I almost think that fueled a lot of the protests and a lot of the anger because there was kind of the immediate like application to what the European Super League would mean it would mean that those matches would then become boring and pointless and we'd we, you know we'd get to a point in the season where nothing meant anything anymore so I did think it was a bit odd. I think as well, um, doing it, you know, in the season as well, it's kind of people are, are very invested. You know, maybe if they'd waited a few weeks and it'd been the Euros and everyone was kind of really focused on England or whatever country they wanted to support, maybe, you know, there'd be less of that kind of passion. Um, and, and you know, as as mentioned as well by James as well, it was kind of that that timing where as we were coming out of the out of lockdown restrictions and fans were hoping to go back to the stadium relatively soon like I think there was quite a lot of passion you know building around the end of the season and being able to go back into the stadium so I think it it was bizarre timing and, and like you said as well the Sunday evening was not for any journalist that is not a nice time to, to drop news <laughs> yeah no absolutely um Nick McGinn uh, Nick Harris mentioned it just before about what potentially could happen off the back of the European Super League in terms of reforms of course we've heard about this fan-led review that Tracy Crouch is carrying out at the moment. What do you think will actually happen, though? I, I mean, I'm not. I, I wouldn't say I'm an, an expert on how this is going to play out in government. What I think you can say is that is that this government and potentially successive ones are, are natural allies of of the type of uh, owners um, who, who are getting involved in football clubs right now. Whether that's governments of Gulf states or whether that's you know hedge fund managers. So they would be taking a stand against the vested interests of, of those organisations. Um, I think without a significant push from supporters, 
um, and, and, and other stakeholders, for want of a better word. Um, I think it's really unlikely that they'll, they'll, they'll tackle that head on. I mean, I'm really encouraged by what's been happening of late, though. Um, you know, the, the fan action that's taken place is, is really remarkable, um, sort of unprecedented for a long time, as, as James mentioned. Um, um, so, um, you know, if there is momentum, there, there is momentum, and if that keeps on going, then potentially um, we will get somewhere. I, I, I'm skeptical, but maybe that's just because I'm naturally skeptical about this thing. But the, the extent of the challenge is huge. I mean, let, let's say, for example, the British government is really going to put in place a 50 plus one rule and take away ownership of Manchester City from the Abu Dhabi government. That strikes me as um, implausible, politically um, politically implausible right now. Um, but you know, who knows how, how how things will play out. And James, uh, Nick's just mentioned it there: the German football model, this fifty plus one uh, model. So essentially, a football club um, can't play in the Bundesliga if commercial investors have, uh, I think, it's more than a forty nine percent stake. How do you think fans can have a stake in the game here in England? There was. One of the things that I, I mean, at the end of the Billionaires Club, I, I mean, not, I mean, to give away the end of it, but you know, I mean, to be honest, I thought the book was dead until this, you know, simply <laughs> came back, brought it back to life. Um, uh, you know, uh, Portsmouth was a great example of, of a team that had almost every type of billionaire owner from around the world, Eastern European. There was Middle Eastern money in there, some American money sniffing around as well. You know, and it was it was a complete disaster. It was the first Premier League club to go out and for, to go into receivership, and so we had a. a, a so, sorry, going to administration. And so um, you had a situation where the fans stepped in and, and the Portsmouth Sports Trust stepped in and took over that club. And it, it was a roaring success. You know, they managed to save, you know, when I went and, and met the club and met the people who'd, who'd saved the club, they'd said, you know, if you, look at the, if you look at the stadium, if you look at the terrace, you know, it is full of amazing people with amazing attributes. You've got lawyers in there, you've got PR people in there, you've got thinkers and and uh, politicos and you've got people who you know there's a lot of talent there and they utilize that talent to put the club back on track um, get rid of the debt keep hold of the stadium which was a major uh, issue there and win promotion to league one eventually um and so everybody was really happy with that because there's a, i think the supporter ownership model is something that is isn't really scalable up to the top level, if, if we're talking about the amount of money that's in the game, the amount of money that you need to compete. So, but eventually what happens is that the, a, a billionaire American owner does come in and everybody just says, oh, well, actually, let's do that because you might get in the Premier League one day. And so, so the, kind of, the story kind of falls flat on its face. But for me, I think, I think Nick is absolutely right, is that, I mean, we, you know, global football has the, the, the blueprint for the absolute best model of ownership, and that is 50 plus one. I know there's problems in Germany, Bayern Munich are uh, dominant. I think they've just won their ninth title in a row. But anyone that has gone to a German football match, anyone that has, has watched a campaign, whether it's for the abolition of Monday night football, uh, for cheaper ticket prices, for re um, reform of police football matches, and seen them win those, those battles and see the power that fans have within the game, would rather have that. Beers at games, cheap tickets... Uh, st a safe standing, all of these things which wouldn't have been there if it wasn't for fan uh, pressure. Now, how to implement that in, in England is going to be very difficult. I mean, the only way that I've thought about it and thought it might be possible is in the same way that if a government came in and decided to uh, renationalize an industry, in that when its term of, you know, however long um, the contract is, is lapses, then it goes back into kind of public ownership. And maybe there is some way that that can be arranged that when the club is sold, because often with a lot of these owners, and this is the, the problem with Portsmouth, it wasn't necessarily the Gadamax that were the problem, although they lost all their money, it was who they sold the club to. And I think it's at that transition point that if there are rules in place that say, well, if somebody comes in, they have to buy it on these terms. These are the rules. And more importantly, that there's a regulator strong enough to, to back up those rules and to enforce them properly, then th that might be one way. But there, it's going to be very difficult because the amount of money, and as Nick said, I mean, you literally have some of the most powerful men in the world owning football clubs. I mean, we almost had Mohammed bin Salman effectively becoming the owner in a roundabout way of Newcastle United. And this is a guy who exerts extraordinary power at almost every level. So 
it's going to be very tough. But I don't think if you have a strong, strong regulation, strong government regulation, it is possible. It's just I don't trust this government to do anything right. So I, that's why I'm sceptical about it. And Nick Harris, I mean, James had just mentioned that a potential regulator in football. Can you see an Ofcom style regulator um, happening in football? Or there being one in football? Well, I've been doing this job for 25 years and we've been having this argument and debate for 25 years. And to be honest, we're no, we're not any closer to getting that regulator. I don't think, um, I, I, I'd like to think this government led review would lead to something that James was, the sort of thing that James was outlining that if you put in place a system whereby the next time a club changes hands, it has to be a 50 plus one. So you obviously couldn't force somebody, you can't force Sheikh Mansour to sell Manchester City and no government will ever make them do it. It's pie in the sky to think otherwise. But supposing at some point in the future, he disinvested himself of whatever percentage and the rule was in place that nobody henceforth could. That That's theoretical, unlikely, I think. I think uh, for me, a more likely route forward would be if we go back and look at the genesis of the Super League. And again, 25 years I've been reporting on different iterations of a breakaway Super League and it's never happened for very for various reasons. And this time um, it was 11 o'clock on the Sunday night. I mean, for me, this is like the biggest sports, I suppose, politics story in decades, certainly the biggest football story in decades, because it really did appear to threaten the structure of football. But if we examine what actually pushed this over the line finally to get those dozen clubs to sign, you know, legally binding agreements, it really came down to the driving forces of Barcelona and Real Madrid principally, because they were so desperate in a pandemic era, because they've got themselves into so much debt, 900 million and a billion euros each. And they've got themselves into that debt because they are phenomenally badly run and have been. So they wanted to try and siphon off the vast majority of football's wealth at the top end because they're so catastrophically badly run and the other greedy clubs piled in with them to try and get this money. If, if we look at that as the thing that drove the ESL to the point that they actually jumped over the cliff and said, we're doing it, I think the solution possibly lies in, in a fundamental restructuring of the game as a whole to disincentivize the kind of people who have bought these football clubs in the first place. So there's a group, if we cite the American owners, the Glazers at Manchester United, John Henry at Liverpool, Stan Kroenke at Arsenal, just to give three examples. These guys are incentivized by one thing, which is money. Money in terms of getting a club, improving its asset value. Your Glazers bought Manchester United for 780 million pounds. It's now worth 2 billion. It throws off loads of profits because they're squeezing the pips and the commercialization. It's money. They have no interest in football in and of itself. The other owners are, are incentivized in different things. You could argue Roman Abramovich was incentivized. Yeah, he kind of liked football. He did attend a lot, but he wanted a safe space in London. He wanted an alternative place to get away. How did he, did he need to flee Russia? Nick can talk about the, the motivation behind maybe Manchester City and Paris Saint-Germain. If you disincentivize these guys and take away the reasons that they got in in the first place, maybe you actually get to a situation where they no longer want to be involved. There's already speculation that maybe the Glazers and John Henry, now the Super League's crumbled. You know, where else can they go to fill their pockets even more? They may decide actually they, they're not going to fulfill those money ambitions in football anymore. And the way you disincentivize that is make football much fairer for all, greater wealth distribution, bring in proper financial controls on whether it's salary capping or luxury taxes, remove, remove the infrastructure whereby a few elite clubs, and we're talking about these 12 and another few hand, handful or two, actually are in a position that they can reap more and more and more money and take a bigger, bigger share of the pie. And that, that's got to come ultimately from UEFA and FIFA or the, or the tournament organisers that, you know, and, and their power as well has to be questioned. Is it right that the tournament organisers, FIFA and UEFA, are also the tournament, are also the game to regulators? I mean, I'm talking about wholesale change to make football, you know, fairer, more competitive and remove the incentives that brought these people into the game in the first place. Because if you, if you haven't got, if Sheikh Mansour doesn't have the incentive to win the Champions League and then basically crown Manchester City, you know, the greatest football club in the world, which effectively will be what happens on Saturday night if they beat, beat Chelsea. If that incentive isn't there, knowing that he can just spend two and a half billion pounds and, and help buy that success, then that disincentivizes him or Mohammed bin Salman or other 
plutocrats and billionaires around the world to getting into the game in the first place. And this is, you know, these are the big, big issues which I have absolutely no faith in um, in being tackled. But those those are the areas I think you have to tackle in order to properly bring the game back to the people who own it, which is the fans. And Nancy, I mean, that's quite an interesting point that Nick mentioned there, uh, fans and, and the fact that there has been one or two changes in the game since the European Super League collapsed. And that is, for example, Chelsea and Tottenham announcing that they're going to have fans on their boards. I think it's from next season onwards. Um, but how much of a difference do you think they'll actually make? I think it is kind of a small difference, isn't it? I think, you know, at the moment you've, you've had a situation where the owners well obviously didn't talk to any fans you know there was no kind of dialogue whatsoever because they obviously didn't um, expect the backlash that did come out of the European Super League it was kind of almost quite unexpected and they clearly don't have a strong understanding of um, the kind of loyalties and the history that that fans have for their club and the love that they have for their club and, and the way they want to keep things the same so I think having those kind of initiatives at least you know it does kind of increase the dialogue somewhat and it does give fans some input um, but it is kind of a very very small step I think it's something that would need to be expanded on and it can you know it, it can't be seen as something that's like a stop gap it can't be seen as something that's you know a, a, a tick box or kind of tokenistic you know there needs to be work done on from that as opposed to just putting that in and then the owner's thinking you know what this is fine we've got like a little bit of fan input Okay, so we've got a few questions that have been sent in advance by uh, some of our viewers. I'm just going to try and get to a few of them and we'll get back on track with our, with our uh, topics of discussion. So the first is, and I'll, I'll put to Nancy since you've just been speaking, um, do you think Germany's or Sweden's 50% rule system would or could work in any of the big five leagues or at least elsewhere? So um, what do you think about that? Yeah, well, I think um, James did mention it briefly. I think it probably is the best solution and and I, I did like the idea of what Nick said you know when you've got um, clubs passing on owners to kind of start implementing that um, so you you know you're kind of building on it bit by bit I think there are certain issues with it obviously you 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 will have a degree of kind of internal um, club politics um, but I think you know in terms of what we've got it's 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 something that's that's definitely um you know, it can work. There's no reason why it can't work. And it, I think a lot of people will think it's, it's better than what we've currently got going on at the moment. Mm. And James, another question here. How do governing bodies like UEFA and FIFA rein in these billionaire owners? Or do you think that horse has bolted? And that's the, the phrase they're using in the question. Uh, they don't. They're absolutely in league with them. I mean, there is pretty, pretty solid reporting. I mean, everybody suspected it at the time that Gianni Infantino, president of FIFA, was was in all likelihood uh, given the green light for the European Super League. He has had um, his own plans to set up a kind of global Super League uh, to replace the Club World Cup. And to do that, he's had to kind of rub shoulders with some, you know, with, with the Mohammed bin Salmans of this world, with Vladimir Putin. There's a famous picture at the start of the Russia 2018 World Cup. So let's not, let's not think that um, this isn't about UEFA and FIFA against the billionaire owners. This is about UEFA and FIFA scrabbling around and getting the billionaire owners on their side for their own power battle between each other about who controls the most lucrative parts of football. And uh, Nick McGeehan, do you see a distinction, cultural or administratively, between the nations who are the football superpowers versus the minnows, as it were? Well, I'm not sure how to, to interpret that question. I mean, <laughs> what, what nations are the football superpowers? Um, I mean, are, they, have, they it, haven't specified, but I mean, are the nations football powers <laughs> like uh, is it Abu Dhabi, UAE, and Qatar, and Saudi Arabia now? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not. I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm not quite sure what, what the question means. To to be honest, um, um, suppose. Do, do you see? Um, Perhaps a difference in how some of these countries are at the moment, um, you know, viewing football and the potential owning of a football club, I suppose, without looking at the football superpowers element of it. But yeah, have you seen differences between different states, perhaps, and, and countries? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you can see a very, you know, very clear reason why the Gulf states want to get into football. If, you know, if, if that's the question, you know, it's a, it's a combination of sort of political reputation and commercial interests. And that's that's why they that's why they want to get into it. And, and they 
they use their leverage very effectively. Um, I feel like I'm sort of flanneling here in, on the basis that I don't still fully understand the question. <laughs> So we'll leave that one there then. Um, and one final question and we'll get back on track with the discussion. Uh, Nick, um, how can you know clubs lower down the football pyramid be included in the discussion about how we overhaul football? Um, with some difficulty in a practical sense, because we saw that with last year's uh, Project Big Picture scheme, which is not unrelated to the Europe Super League. This was a, um, a plan dreamt up by Joel Glazer principally, along with John Henry of Liverpool, where they um, basically wanted to restructure the Premier League in a power sense so that seven clubs suddenly had all the power in the Premier League um, and could dictate uh, how it was run. Uh, they claimed um, that they would generate lots more money by allowing clubs to sell their own TV rights partially. Um, I got a copy of their blueprint and went through it. Um, it was back of fag packet nonsense, a lot of it. Uh, it didn't involve input, um, serious input, or rather it did involve, depressingly, it did involve input from the EFL, who actually came out saying they would like this to go ahead because they'd been promised a load more money on the back of it. But when you actually dug down into the figures, the money wouldn't have been there. It, uh, and it's depressing that the EFL's leadership sort of backed this project big picture plan again out of desperation in a pandemic um, so depressingly when the 72 EFL clubs and those indeed even lower down the, the chain are, are, are sort of don't even have the power for their their own leadership groups to sort of speak up for them it's very hard in a meaningful sense for those clubs to to really you know make any difference to this debate which is it's depressing that that's that's football. I mean, of course, uh, levels below the Premier League, um, football is 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 kind of a much simpler and less political game in one sense. But also, in in say the Championship, where something like eighteen of the twenty four Championship clubs are owned by billionaires, all striving to be part of the Premier League's billionaires club. You know, it's 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 insane and people below the championship are inspiring to get into the championship to be part of that race to be in the Premier League where you can have loads of money and be really badly run and still not have a much chance of winning anything. So um, I guess, you know, just the normal support your club, go to your club, you know, be a part of your local community. I think which probably we'd all agree that as football fans that that we we want our clubs to be community institutions that are good for the communities in which they're based but again that's very old-fashioned um old-fashioned view but then I was born before 1992. Okay we'll, we'll get back on track with the football discussion so yesterday of course with the Europa League final we we did see a shock I think it is safe to say with Villarreal beating Manchester United and of course we've got a Champions League final coming up this weekend between Manchester City and Chelsea, so James, from a geopolitical standpoint, how big of a game is this for the owners of each club? Well, I mean, I mean, Nick should uh, weigh in on this as well. But for this is this is this is what Sheikh Mansour at Manchester City has been aiming for since he took over the club in two thousand and eight, and this has been uh, the, the investment of the royal family of Abu Dhabi, the Al Nayans, into Manchester City has been part of a you know a campaign, effectively a, a kind of. Uh, a, a way of repositioning Abu Dhabi and the United Arab Emirates in the world, uh, rep, uh, laundering its reputation, uh, opening doors to uh, positions of power and influence within within the UK and within Europe. And part of that was first establishing the club, spending big, winning the Premier League, and the the end result was always to win the Champions League and to say, you know, we've done it. We're, we're the champions of Europe, and along along the way. They have really manipulated. I mean, there was the, the, the financial fair play decision, which went against them, but then obviously the, that was overturned. And there's been just a, a massive body of evidence against how that club has been run, um, and in not not in a particular ethical way, I don't think. And it's every time you kind of criticise the club uh, or the owners for that. Then I mean, I'm sure that Nick and Nick. Well, and probably Nancy too can can te testify to the fact that you get quite a lot of abuse for that. So 
um, this is the this is the this is the end of the project. This is you know what you know what do they do after this? Because they have established they've taken Manchester City, which was a you know not that long ago in the third tier. Um, they have taken it to the top of the Premier League, to the top of Europe. Along the way, completely laundered the United Arab Emirates reputation, which is a pretty serious human rights abusing country, zero democracy. Um, Sheikh Mansour is, you know, one of the most powerful men in that country. He's a, he's a political figure. He's a royal family figure. Um, and to think that this was just football or money, which they don't need, um, is ridiculous. This is about power and projecting projecting power across the world. But Nick Nick is Nick is the man, really. That I'll bring on a super sub and throw the question <laughs> to him. So yeah, Nick, what do you think about that then? Uh, James just just answered what I was going to say. I mean, it's 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 Project Abu Dhabi over over actual Abu Dhabi, you know. And Project Abu Dhabi is about you know Khalid Al Mubarak, you know the the. The director of the club said this, said as much. You know that's why we want the club. We want to project the values of Abu Dhabi through the club. Actual Abu Dhabi is war crimes in Yemen. It's personal involvement in child slavery and trafficking. Um, so when we say human rights abuses, I think we want to spell out just how just how serious those are. I mean, they're deeply abusive, deeply corrupt government. And and yeah, this is them at the top. Um, this is them having overturned UEFA, having disposed of, of Qatar, their enemy, via PSG along the way. So it's a moment of, um, of, of triumph for them, I think. I think it is very interesting to see where they'll take it from now. Um, now they're at the top. Um, now they know what they can glean from it in terms of political power, uh, in terms of reputational enhancement, in terms of commercial um, opportunities, which is part of it. Um, it will be interesting to see if they look to expand it. Um, or if they look to dial it back at some point, or if you know circumstances intervene in some way and 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 and, and that situation changes. And Nancy, if City were not to win the Champions League uh, this weekend, how much of a disappointment do you think it'd be for the owners? Yeah, I think it, it would be. I think as as everyone here has alluded to, I think that that's kind of the end goal almost. It's kind of you know you you become Champions League Europe, and, and that is the aim. Um, so I think it would be, but at the same time, you know, they've got the resources to to go again and continue um, doing so in kind of future years. And that's, you know, that's not to say that Chelsea are not also a complete powerhouse in football as well. Um, if they were to lose to Chelsea, it's not really like that much. It's not really a lesser of an evil. Um, I think that is why there's been, you know, people are really happy to kind of see Leicester win the FA Cup. And I suppose to an extent, Villarreal win the Europa League as well, because I think it's been a bit of an antidote to the kind of these big, um, rich um, football clubs who have put in money and, and kind of a, a recover for something that's a bit more insidious, like the Abu Dhabi regime. Um, so, it, you know, it's kind of been a bit of an antidote to see clubs like Leicester um, kind of break that dominance and, and, and win and shows that, you know, there is hope that even though um, a lot of clubs have the resources to just completely dominate that that there is still a chance for, for football it's not quite gone over the edge yet and so I think yeah people will be will be hoping I mean Chelsea and City they're both it's not really a lesser of two evils but it's there are stories this season that shows that you know it's not completely over. Mm. And Nick Harris um, I'm just going to go back to the, the power potentially that fans hold in terms of what we saw with the social media consensus against the ESL, the protests that we've seen and perhaps we will see again next season. Do you think fans are becoming more aware of the power that they do hold and how they can use it if they're not happy with a decision that the owner of their club takes? Uh, no, I think that everyone was surprised by the unanimity of the response to the ESL. It was just so immediate and and all consuming that this was just a unique situation fans by and large are powerless um you know occasionally liverpool fans protested about ticket prices a few seasons ago and and the the ownership listened and i think um prevented rises of ticket prices on some home tickets but things like that are few and far between i think most fans know that fans generally certainly in england are powerless again james talked earlier about the the ultras culture in other places but I don't think most fans, most fans realize they're pretty powerless they don't they're not going to influence their owners they're not going to influence uh, the, the governing bodies um, one thing I was going to say earlier about ESL was I mean 
another reason it failed apart from the fan backlash is because it was a total dog's breakfast from the first evening. I mean, 11 o'clock at night, you know, the instant response against. Then you had Pep Guardiola, a manager, coming out and basically criticising it on live television. I mean, as soon as he did that on, I think it was the Tuesday afternoon, I thought the thing would be dead by the end of the week and it was dead within sort of six or eight hours. The fact that Gary Neville, you know, on Monday night football had so vociferously spoken so publicly, but also the figures never added up to me. They were, they were you know, the, the blueprint was proposing something like five billion pounds of um, prize money, um, you know, they didn't have a TV deal in place. There was broadcasters were publicly backing away from from this thing. It, it just didn't seem to stack up. Again, the numbers didn't even stack up. It was just a phenomenal cock up on, on behalf of all of those involved. So while the fans were definitely important, I don't think we should suddenly think the fans, fans are, are, are suddenly um, powerful. Um, there's one question here that I think is quite interesting for all of us to look at. I'm just looking on the, the chat. Uh, from Gavin Simpson, who says, have any of us come across players that would not play for the clubs that we're talking about for ethical reasons? <laughs> no, I've never come across um, a player who would who would say, I'm not going to go and play for Paris Saint-Germain because of, uh, of, of Kafala in Qatar. I've got one. I reckon Mohamed Abu Trekka okay. probably would. I reckon he would he would be pretty ethical. About okay, there were, there, were some, there were also some Bahraini players, weren't there? back yeah. in the day when Sheikh um, Salman was standing for... But, but I mean, for example, um, footballers, I think they just, they don't necessarily, I'm not saying they're apol apolitical or that they're stupid or anything like or disengaged, but their careers are short. They make decisions based on if you can earn 300 grand a week playing for one of these super clubs and, and have a better chance of winning the Champions League you're going to. If your Pep Guardiola and Qatar are going to pay you hundreds of thousands of pounds to endorse a world club in, in Qatar, you'll take his money. And then when Abu Dhabi offer you 20 million pounds a year to be the manager, even though they're the sworn enemies of Qatar, he'll take their money as well because he's a commercial guy and, and football's a commercial game. So no, um, I, I, I don't know. And on the, on the same token of that, um, we, we have seen some very, very sporadic and quite small scale um, protests during one of the recent international rounds with a couple of national teams holding up banners about the Qatar 2022 World Cup. But, and, and I know that at FIFA Congress last week, the Finnish FA actually took, took the mic and, and made a point in the con Congress about assurances about what FIFA were going to be do to make sure about the, the, work, the workers, migrant workers, human rights in Qatar. But again, they're if not a lone voice, a very, very small voice. And most of the rest of the world are just going to not sleepwalk into a Qatar World Cup. But this is a World Cup handed to Qatar by the most corrupt sporting electorate the world has ever known in, in a deeply corrupt vote in December 2010. Uh, something that should have been properly investigated and, and litigated well before now. And this World Cup is still going ahead. And, and what is anybody going to say about it? Which national FA is going to boycott that World Cup? None, I'm guessing. Which players are going to say, we don't want to go to that World Cup? Very, very few. Which media companies are going to say, we're not going to go and cover it because it was a deeply corrupt decision in a country with an appalling human rights record? And I think that's a question for all of us, as well as fans. How many fans are going to boycott that tournament? I don't know what you think, Nick. I mean, it's really interesting what you're talking about. I mean, the, the, the way the players stood up there in, in Norway and Germany and Holland elsewhere is fascinating. And it is interesting that they did it in a country context, not, not a club context, right? Um, so you've got, for example, Martin Odegaard, um, who's taking exception to what's happening in Qatar when he's playing for Norway, but is then, you know, playing for, playing for Arsenal, you know, sponsored by Emirates. Sorry, Nancy, I don't mean to... To, 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 to get into that too much. But at the, same time, at the same time, apparently Odegaard is one of the players who is incredibly engaged on this issue, has read everything about it, he knows everything about it, and has taken a really informed stance on it. So, I mean, I, I look at that issue, and while I share, you know, I'm sceptical about what's going to happen, I don't think that the Qatar 2022 World Cup is going to be derailed because of it, but they are putting a pressure on it in a way that's never happened before. The Catholics are terrified of what's happening. You know, they're really, it's really... It's really knocked them for six a little bit, you know, this stuff. And it is coming from, to a large extent, the players, you know. Although it was fans in Norway and to maybe to an extent fans in Germany with Bayern Munich, which, which sort of kicked this off. Um, so I, 
you know, as a, as a sort of activist who, who campaigns for people to get engaged and to be involved and to take stances on things, I think what's happened there is actually very positive. Uh, and it, while I don't think it's it's going to change things overnight, I wonder if it's something that we can, you know, we can look to to build on um, as time goes on. And Nick, just to, just I'll stay with you. If you could make one reform in football, what would it be? That's to me. That's to you, yeah. Uh, it would be don't allow. See, I come at it from a very narrow perspective. I would say, I would say, don't allow nation states to own football clubs. I would, I would start with that one. But I'm sure there are uh, more qualified people, including the three other panelists, who would have a, a longer list of of more detailed things. Well, I'm putting that question to everyone. So, James, what would you do if you could make one reform in football? Well, that that would be my my reform would be because the ownership of, and it's not just financially it's also we had this um incredible potential um conflict of interests if saudi arabians if pif effectively the investment arm of the saudi state took over newcastle united um that sheffield united had a minor member of the royal family from saudi arabia owning the club as well which meant that you had the potential Mohammed bin salman who famously locked up a lot of um, his relatives and a lot of the top business people in the Riyadh hilton to extract money from them, apparently an anti-corruption campaign. You are somebody who's prepared to do that, implicated in the Jamal Khashoggi case. So you had this situation where Sheffield United, Newcastle, maybe they're going to the last game of the season. Do you think there's going to be no uh, pressure put on Sheffield United? That's what happens when you have nation states, when you have political, powerful people in charge of football clubs. It's not just the money, it's also the influence. And they're unregulatable. They're completely ungovernable. Um, Manchester City... You know, if you try to, there's all those emails that um, as soon as new wafers try to stop them spending the money they want to spend, so we'll destroy you. We'll spend more, we've got more money. We've got deep pockets, deepest pockets. Uh, so they are unregulatable. So, and I, I suspect that's one of the reasons why the Premier League ultimately uh, decided not to. And the way to do that, the way to, and Germany is a prime example of this. Sorry to bang on about 50 plus one, but that stops that kind of ownership. How many of these type of owners have got minority stakes? In German football, none. They're not interested in minority stakes. They're not interested in not having complete power and domain over that over that club, even a very successful league like Germany. So I, I agree with Nick. We've got to stop states owning football clubs. To do that, you have to, as the other Nick said, disincentivize uh, the ownership of a club in a way that isn't doesn't exist in English football at the moment. And to do that is to implement some form. 60 plus four. I mean, a lot of German fans I meet say zero plus uh, 100 plus zero. But, um, you know, we, we have to bring in a system like that because we have to disincentivize owning a football club. And Nancy, what do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's quite a few things. And I think we've talked a lot about ownership. And I think one of the things that I'd say personally, just from the work I've been doing recently in women's sport is um, you know, when you have an, an owner of a club, that there's certain commitments they've got to make to their women's football teams. Um, talking about the European Super League, that um, line that they put put in it in, about women's football, I think probably for the first time you could have left women's football out and everyone would have been happy about it. I, I, no one would have been offended about it. Um, and I think it was really reflective of the way those owners involved in the clubs treat their women's team. So Liverpool, for instance, their team is in the second tier of women's football, really kind of struggling, uh, don't have the resources. Man United, it's a relatively new team. Um, apparently, this is reported, but they've, they've lost one of the best uh, young managers in women's football because they're not giving her the resources and they train in the tent. Um, Real Madrid is a relatively new team as well. So I think, you know, when you've got these kind of um, owners coming in and I, I just want to see some kind of, like, kind of commitment and some kind of framework in place where you have to essentially take all aspects of the club seriously and that's also including including the women's team it can't be some it can't just be a line in a statement or like a a box to tick it's got to be something that's sustainable and and you know well worth the investment and nick finally if you could make one reform in football what would it be I, ownership is central to everything but then so is the mechanism by which you can bring that about so um in terms of an ownership mechanism i guess you come back to something like 50 plus one which is almost impossible to implement from a standing start in all the countries that it doesn't happen 
Uh, but yeah, obviously banning nation states from owning football clubs will, would be a start, but it, it would also be maybe, uh, and again, this isn't going to happen, so we're kind of talking pie in the sky, but it wasn't that long ago that it was actually forbidden in English football to take dividends out of a football club. You could have, football clubs were community assets, they were clubs, as in, you know, clubs of the in the truest sense owned by the members and therefore you couldn't run clubs for profit you almost by definition had to run clubs to lose money or break even because that's the point of the club you couldn't run them for profit obviously we're not going to go back to those days if in a more in a more realistic sense maybe i would introduce um something that would inject fairness and disincentivize profiteering so in a specific financial sense that might be a luxury tax on wages in different competitions because then if you want to if you're i don't know um john henry and you want to spend a billion pounds a year on wages and, and you can bring all the best players or incentivize them with the biggest pay packets but that the, there is a luxury tax on a wage bill above say 200 million pounds so you're allowed to spend a billion this happens by the way in, in some american sports particularly and china as well china reporting a system yeah they've, they've introduced it but obviously it happens in baseball so if if live if x club's owner wanted to spend a billion pounds a year on a wage bill to attract messi ronaldo and everyone else and, and, and they have to pay luxury tax over and above the 200 million pound limit, they would have to pay an 800 million pound tax, which would then be divided between the other teams in that league or competition. That immediately, um, I, I think that, that immediately brings a, a huge amount of fairness. Having a billion pound wage bill by no means guarantees success as Barcelona have shown with their 500 million pound wage bill and Manchester United and other clubs that have huge wage bills. But, it would be basically the richest people would be directly funding their rivals. I think that is something that would have a real world direct effect and also disincentivize some of the behavior that we've seen today. That would be one specific financial thing, I think, that would have an effect. The chance of that being introduced are as close to zero as, as, as it's possible to get without actually being zero. So we've got quite a few questions to get through. I'm going to just pick a couple now because we're running out of time. There's a really good question here from Jonas, who's asked, um, do you think fan activism only has a chance to change something if it's done on an international level, meaning that you might have to compromise what you might achieve for your individual club, but you get a number of leagues or countries on the same page? Or would you suggest that fans take care of their own club and their league first uh, because there are obviously disparities between the different leagues? So I'll, I'll, I'll put that to James. I mean, look, it, everything starts at home, right? I mean, it doesn't matter what tier your club is. I mean, if you get organised and get people protesting against things that are happening at your club and change those, those are really important to change the things closer to home. And we can talk about solidarity, hands across the ocean with other groups. And there's there's great pan-European, pan-global supporters organisations that do just that. And, and they're doing some great work. But you know, this is this is a, it's a, a local game. I know it's an international game, but its roots are in, you know, these are community assets for the community. And so these are communities who, it, it shouldn't be seen as a waste for communities to, to campaign for change within their club, even if it seems small. I mean, we might think, looking at, in German football, I remember the, the protest about stopping Monday night football. That seems like a, that's, small beer for some people right but if you have monday night football in a big club like in a big country like germany you essentially have people having to take days off and it's you know it's against working people working people can't travel and see their clubs but they campaigned the fans campaigned individually and then and then and then they came together and it became a kind of a countrywide movement so i don't think the we should look at it as as, as two separate things do like do, lo do local and the global will follow and Nick McGinn, this is definitely a question, I think, for you. This is from Jasmine. How does media and human rights activists help impact the sports events? So I'm guessing that that could you could probably talk about this for a long time. But in, in short, what would you say? Yeah, just look at just look at Qatar, you know, look at the, the attention that's been placed on that issue. Um, look at the role that supporters have played in that in places like Germany and um, you know, the Bayern Munich supporters key example um i i think it's the question is how effective can it be you know um but i think the point is that that without media interest uh, and good media attention and i would also say that we are going through a what i think is a, is a golden generation of 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 football journalism 
um, some of the panelists on here being part of that, you know, real great investigative work that's shining a light on on the darker side of the game um, that, that we won't get where we need to be. So it's 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 vital, I would say. OK, thank you so much, Nick. So unfortunately, we run out of time for the questions, but thank you to everyone who did uh, submit your questions and your comments. Um, so, yeah, thank you to my panel today and everyone, of course, who joined the chat uh, for your time. Now, of course, we do have a weekly debate. You can check out our website and social media for the details or go to opendemocracy.net forward slash en forward slash live discussions. Now, Open Democracy does rely on contributions and donations. So if you want to see more public interest journalism like this, please support Open Democracy by going to support.opendemocracy.net forward slash donate. Thank you again and uh, see you next week.